Mathica video. Today in the MGH Life Sciences and Medical World News, the Center for Biosimilars is pleased to welcome Sean McGowan, Senior Director of Biosimilars at Marisource Bergen. What do you advise biosimilar manufacturers or developers about working through these obstacles to get their products to market and build up a sizable share? No, it's, it, it's a great question. And, and um, you know, at, at a company like Marisource Bergen, where uh, not only do we do uh, drug distribution, but we have hub services uh, for providers where we have, um, you know, payer consulting, um, a payer consulting group that can advise on, on how to contract appropriately, um, given, you know, how, whatever specific market um, they're operating in. Um, you know, manufacturers, you know, need to approach this, this market specifically around biosimilars, um, the same way that the innovator companies uh, have, have brought these products to market, right? So, so think like a brand company, think like a specialty company launching these products, um, you know, contract uh, how um, and with the same customers that um, the innovator company has, um, you know, figure out what your payer strategy is going to be, figure out how you're going to, um, you know, promote this product into uh, the different classes of trade, how you're going to promote this product to uh, your physician groups, how you're going to promote this product to your hospital health systems. Um, you know, so, so we've got, so, so it's, it's really kind of coming to market the same way that, that the innovator product did. Um, but, you know, provide that, that level of, um, you know, commercial activity, uh, and kind of match that of the innovator company. Um, and then also it depends on, you know, the, um, the, the type of portfolio that, uh, that in uh, that company that's bringing about a similar to market, um, you know, what type of portfolio already exists for them. So, um, you know, are they operating in the same markets that their biosimilar is going to be operating in? Uh, do they need to introduce themselves? Do they need to um, go out and kind of market themselves and, and kind of garner, um, you know, the level of trust that, that existing companies already have with, with customers in that space? Um, you know, it can be easy for some companies that, that have kind of a legacy, whether it be in the oncology space or the supportive care space, or, you know, kind of in the, in the uh, inflammatory or the anti-TNF space. Um, much harder for, for organizations that um, are coming new to market that don't already have kind of that recognition in that space. And so uh, depending on uh, the level of uh, confidence and comfort that those customers have with a specific uh, manufacturer will kind of determine uh, how much activity that they, they have to, um, you know, uh, that they have to kind of put out and, and um, you know, operate in um, to, to, to gain that level uh, of trust and confidence with, uh, with those end customers. Experts tend to doubt as much biosimilar product variety can compete side by side as has occurred with generics. Physicians can't stock all of these products. What's your opinion? Yeah, so this is kind of the, you know, the, an interesting challenge um, that, that, I, that, that probably wasn't um, kind of really thought about until, you know, we had kind of a, a multi-source situation uh, for, for a lot of these markets, right? So, you know, if you think back to, um, the, the summer of 2019, prior to the first oncology products um, being launched into the market, you know, there were, there were only, um, you know, two or three biosimilar markets where there were actually, uh, you know, multiple entrants, so multiple biosimilars plus that, that uh, reference product that were competing there. And so, you know, it, it was something that, um, you know, didn't really need to be addressed uh, at the time, but, um, you know, since those, those first oncology products have, have come onto the market. Um, you know, we had two that launched uh, in July of 2019. And, and since then, we're, we're up to, uh, I believe, nine um, oncology products in those three uh, oncology markets, uh, Avastin, Receptin, and Rituxin. So, um, you know, it's one, it's really good. One, I think it's a good thing where we have a kind of a multi-source situation where we have, um, you know, great legacy manufacturers that know how to manufacture specialty and biologic products that are, are bringing products to market, right? So it's creating choice and access for uh, customers and patients, which is a really good thing. Uh, you know, these products are coming to market at a, at a significant discount um, from a WAC price basis uh, compared to that of the innovator product, which is a really good thing. That's gonna help uh, create uh, access affordability and drive cost savings, uh, not only for customers but, uh, and physicians, uh, but also for patients, most importantly. Um, but it does create a, a level of um, added complexity that wasn't uh, that, that didn't really have to be dealt with um, prior to the launch of these biosimilars. So um, what we're hearing from our customers is that yes, this is is a bit of a challenge where 
they, they do have a lot of choice, but um, having to carry multiple products uh, can create, uh, uh, you know, a certain, um, you know, certain level of additional work, um, you know, maybe potentially some additional carrying costs. But um, largely what we're hearing from our customers is that kind of as they, as they kind of figure out how to leverage their EMRs uh, and the technology uh, and the workflows uh, within their practices or in their health systems, um, that, that it's something that they can manage. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's something that they, they can manage. You know, and so for us as a, as a distribution partner and, and a commercialization partner, um, you know, our, our, our first goal is always to create access for these products for our customers. So ensure that we always have access to the products from the manufacturer. So how do we work with the manufacturers? How do we contract appropriately? Uh, how do we gain access to these products? And then with the customers, it's, you know, again, going kind of going back to the education pieces, you know, educating these customers on what products are available, what classes do they fall in, uh, what are they indicated for, uh, and then how to access those products uh, through Amerisourceburg. And so that's something that we, we, we do and work very closely with our customer account teams to ensure that uh, everybody is up to, up to speed and up to date on uh, the, what, what the market looks like and what products are available. Um, and then, you know, working with those downstream customers to really understand, um, you know, do they have preferences on the products that they want to purchase? Um, do they have, you know, specific relationships or do they have kind of specific preferences as far as the manufacturer that they want to, that they want to work with or, uh, or utilize? Um, and then also having kind of that more deeper conversation of understanding that um, kind of that, that medical, the, the medical benefit or that payer is going to dictate to a certain level of what products need to be utilized understanding what that pair mix for those customers looks like, um, you know, so that, that, you know, you, you could get it, for example, you could get a customer that, um, you know, has 70% commercial lives walking through their doors and they have three major pairs um, that kind of cover those lives. And each of those pairs are going to require a different, uh, let's say, trastuzumab, right? So that Herceptin market that now has five biosimilars in them. So you have five biosimilars plus the innovators. So you have six products to choose from. You've got three different pairs that, um, have three different kind of uh, formulary requirements as far as what products can be used. Um, you know, so, so it creates a little bit of additional work there. But, um, you know, what we're hearing from customers is that, uh, that they're able to, you know, as long as they're able to kind of update their order sets and, and integrate um, this information in their EMRs appropriately and then, you know, leverage, um, you know, the, 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 the prior authorization department um, that are calling on these health plans to ensure that these products are covered. Uh, as, as long as those workflows are, are working properly and appropriately, uh, they can absolutely address those issues. Is there a solution that ensures the most robust price competition within a biosimilar drug category? <sighs> that's the, that, that's the, the, the $10 million question um, that I think the industry is, is, uh, is working to address, um, you know, in a, in a very thoughtful manner. So, um, you know, I, I, I've seen, uh, Kind of the proposals uh, out to CMS around uh, some some shared savings models um, that are being presented, uh, which I think is a, is an interesting uh, path to be going down. I think it's one that that absolutely needs to be um, you know looked at and analyzed and, and figured out. I think that that can be a a, uh, a good a good path there as long as um, you know it, it's not uh, detrimental to. Um, kind of the level of reimbursement that the physician practices, um, you know, would experience. We don't want to, you know, drive, you know, reimbursement down so much that, that um, you know, it, it really puts uh, a lot of uh, financial pressure on, on, these, on these oncology practices. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in, in my mind and something that, that we've talked about a lot in the past, uh, and I think what you'll hear from a lot of biosimilar manufacturers uh, is that, um, you know, encouraging the, uh, the, the payers and the commercial plans uh, to cover uh, all biosimilars at parity uh, with the innovator product. Um, so in, in other words, don't, um, don't disadvantage uh, the biosimilar products against an innovator um, and don't block, um, you know, the, the ability for uh, customers to, to utilize these products. So you know, in, in my mind, I think, um, you know, allowing kind of parity, leveling the playing field, allowing these products to be covered uh, at, the, at the same rates uh, as each other and as a, the innovator product um, is, is going gonna, is gonna to do a couple of things. It allows kind of just that, that free market competition to happen. Uh, it allows the manufacturers to compete, um, you know, as they normally would without having to, you know, um, 
put out additional value into the into the marketplace that um, you know would 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 otherwise uh, hurt them. Um, and and I think most importantly, it it provides uh, a level of choice that uh, puts that choice firmly in the hands of the physicians and the patients. Um, I think the the most frustrating point around uh, kind of the payment models and, and the coverage models for biosimilars that we hear from our uh, our physicians, our physician classes of trade in the oncology space and the oncology space, um, as well as the hospital health systems, is that um, you know they feel like they're the, the choice is being forced upon them as opposed to them making the choice for uh, for their you know in in partnership with their patients, which which is something that um, you know the, the, these these physicians absolutely want to be able to have that choice and not to be forced into it. So. Uh, you know, in my mind, I think I think parity coverage for these products is, is probably going to be the, the 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 best, most complete answer. But um, but you know, it's 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 really nice to see that um, you know there is some thought being put out in uh, some alternative payment uh, models like shared savings uh, model that that is currently being proposed.